Next, we have Rob Simcoe, who is Francis Friedman Professor of Physics and Director of the MIT Kavli Institute. And we're going to be hearing about big telescopes, um, glass and steel. Alrighty, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am uh, not an alumnus of KIPAC, but I'm happy to be here and represent one of your sister Kavli Institutes. Uh, and grateful to Risa for having me. Uh, we. Uh, during the pandemic, we had a support group for directors that was consisted of the two of us. Uh, and uh, it was uh, something that helped get me through. So I appreciate that very much. And it's nice to be here in person. Uh, I've got a remit here to talk about uh, another kind of telescope uh, that's being developed by the US and international communities. These are the extremely large telescopes. Uh, and so like some of our other talks today, this is gonna be a mixture of technical uh, and historical kind of background to try and provide uh, a broader view. Uh, and it's going to be really about how we take telescopes. Oh, this, uh, it absorbs that. That's so interesting. Um, so it's about how uh, telescopes, uh, like the 200 inch here, are used uh, to advance our understanding of the universe uh, in different sort of uh, punctuations on equilibrium that has existed over the past several hundred years. Uh, and just a quick outline of the points I want to make. Uh, first, it's going to be uh, try to uh, instill this idea that scientific advancement really is enabled by what I'll call vertically integrated sets of observatories, uh, and that happens at the national level. Uh, and those consist of discovery engines, which we've heard a lot about today. Uh, those are the things that are the real survey instruments. Uh, and then there's going to be a portion of the network that does triage to try and pick out the most interesting objects from those. Uh, and then there's going to be what I call closers, or high value targets that can be observed with big glass. Uh, and you can do science at each one of those stages, right? There's, um, you know, LSST is not going to need bigger telescopes to do some fraction of its science, but there's other parts of the science uh, that are really going to benefit from access to other observatories as well. Uh, and then I'll argue that the U.S. is really invested in uh, the discovery and triage portions of this, but there's going to be a mismatch in the sort of upper end of this uh, that needs addressing, um, and that the, these large ground-based telescopes are kind of the natural complement uh, to these things that we've heard about so far, uh, and for decades. So um, just to, to go back, I, I promised a little bit of history. Uh, and if you go back, uh, we've heard uh, a little bit from Kimmy's talk and also from uh, Juna as well, uh, this idea that uh, discovery is really tied to improvements in measurement, right? Our theories and our models really only need to be as good as the data that we use to test against them. Uh, and for a long time, um, you know, when we were just observing with our eyes uh, and you could observe the retrograde motion of a planet like Mars, um, epicycles, which have kind of a bad name, they were fine for a long time, right? They got the job done until they didn't anymore uh, when there were observations that were better. Uh, and a lot, you know, an important um, development in this uh, history came with Tycho Brahe's uh, astrograph that he had used to measure much more accurately without a telescope, the motion of the planets, at, at which point it no longer became tenable to use epicycles. Um, and that sort of unleashed a whole torrent of things over the next couple of hundred years. Um, and this is just the start, but the idea of building something with a particular science agenda in mind, but hoping for uh, surprises is a theme that we've heard about, and uh, I'm going to try to document a few of those important ones. Um, it, it is the case that about since uh, 1640 and the invention of the telescope, uh, it's been the case that the aperture size of the biggest telescopes in the world has doubled roughly every 50 years or so. Um, and uh, with each one of those doublings, uh, there is a way that we understand our place in the universe a little bit differently. Right? We're talking about leaps in not just you know, discoveries that we make as professionals, we follow the incremental things, but something that helps us as a society to better understand these big questions that we're interested in uh, and that are important to human nature. Um, so going way back, as I said, it started with uh, Galileo. So uh, that curve worked except at the very beginning. You see that Galileo had three of these telescopes and he was one of the few people that beat the curve. Uh, so it's good to be early, um, although I, he got thrown in the slammer uh, for, for this. Uh, for, for taking a little bit too far. But some of the discoveries that he made include um, the motion of Jupiter's moons. There you see the, his notebook on the left, uh, and also drawings that he made of the lunar surface. Uh, and so uh, he was able to um, uh, really get us started on this road. Um, not so long after that, uh, Hevelius had built another telescope that was 12 centimeters in diameter. So Hevelius is kind of a B-lister in the, the, the group of people that I'm going to be discussing today. You see his telescope uh, down on the lower left, which is kind of a ridiculous contraption. Uh, made up of what looks like a suspension bridge. Um, but he had discovered uh, the moon's libration, right? So we always know that the same side of the moon faces us, but if you look at it over a course of a month, it sort of moves around like this, which I had a nice video and keynote that I can't show on this PDF, but uh, we can uh, talk about it afterwards if you want to see that. Um, he also uh, 
made measurements of comets that were accurate enough to show that they were orbiting the sun. Uh, so the first infer uh, inference of that. Um, so Huygens, uh, somewhat later, had developed a telescope that was 20 centimeters in diameter. Um, that one was also ridiculous. You see it on the left. Uh, there was a, a big pole that had one lens, and then he had something that looked like a fishing rod that, um, that tightened that. I have no idea how he got that to be in focus. Um, but he did, and uh, he discovered the uh, Saturn's moon Titan, and also that it was inclined. So you see the sketches in his notebook uh, on the lower left um, that show the, the rings as they go uh, through the course of a year. Uh, so those were all refracting telescopes. Of course, this is one of the most famous telescopes ever. This is Newton's telescope, and he had uh, discovered the principle of, uh, well, that a parabolic reflector would produce a, um, an image. Uh, this is, I'm not going to talk about his discoveries in great detail, other than that, I think this is just a really nice example of uh, craftsmanship. Uh, this is a really well-made and, uh, and elegant design. Um, but it enabled uh, larger telescopes yet, which uh, opened up yet more discovery space. This is an example of an inelegant telescope design um, that was never really replicated after that. Uh, this is uh, Herschel's telescope. Uh, and uh, you can see the uh, one and a quarter meter diameter mirror uh, in the upper left that was made out of a sort of copper tin alloy, which was what mirrors were made out of back in the day. Uh, he had discovered the uh, Uranus and also uh, was the first person to chart double star orbits as well. Uh, so there's Herschel. He beat the curve too, um, uh, but it, that thing was never super operational. So now, um, so I've moved my, my little chart to the upper right here. So you can take a look at this. And if you notice, there's a sort of horizontal uh, oval showing that uh, after Herschel, things sort of stalled out for a while and the size of the apertures was not growing all that much. Um, and uh, but often when this happens, there's a few times that this has happened uh, historically. And then there are big advances that happen from better instrumentation and better analysis methods. And so in the mid 1800s, even though the apertures weren't growing, the discovery came from the introduction of photographic plates, uh, objective prisms, and then they stopped making um, uh, telescopes out of polished metal and they changed to glass with silver on top of it. Um, and this was really the innovation of uh, analyzing plates uh, and so on the bottom right, you see a plate that was taken with the um, Great Refractor 15-inch uh, telescope at Harvard Observatory, which was the first use of an objective prism that was used for the Henry Draper survey. Uh, and those were, uh, for the most part, uh, cataloged by uh, Annie Jump Cannon, uh, who you see on the upper left. Um, and uh, images through the same telescope were used uh, to study the period luminosity relationship of Cepheid variables. Uh, that was uh, Henrietta Leavitt. Uh, and so uh, those re uh, resulted in uh, yet another sort of leap in our understanding of the universe, including the temperature-based classification of stellar spectra, uh, and also, as I said, the period luminosity relationship. So this is a, a page from Henrietta Leavitt's notebook, uh, where I'd always wondered how, um, how she knew uh, the distances to these things, but it, she didn't know the absolute distance. They were just all in the Magellanic cloud. Uh, and so she said, well, wouldn't it be nice if we knew the distance to these things, then we could nail it down. Uh, and then a few years later, Hertzsprung, uh, Hertzsprung of the HR diagram fame had measured the parallax to uh, a Cepheid in the uh, galactic disk. And then that unlocked all this. And then we sort of went off from there. I also wondered how, uh, how she could classify all of these stars from something that looks like this. Um, but if you get up here and look closely at like these A stars, if you get up close, you can actually see the Balmer lines in this. It's actually pretty cute. Um, uh, maybe you can see them from where you are. It's pretty amazing what she did. Uh, okay, uh, now uh, I'm still working on my whirlwind tour here. I'm, I promise I'm going to get to today's telescope soon, but I think this is all just setting the, the stage. Uh, so George Ellery Hale was the next person to kind of beat the curve, although he started off behind, right? So he was kind of slacker down here, but eventually caught up. Uh, he was uh, MIT class of 90, 1890. Um, so I had to, had to get that one in there. His first telescope uh, was built using uh, family money that was uh, made uh, from the, uh, after the Chicago fire, his, uh, his family had built elevators uh, for the new buildings that went up. He used that to finance some of these early telescopes. Uh, the Yerkes refractor was his first big one, but it wasn't as impactful as some of the later ones he built after moving to uh, the beautiful West Coast. Um, and so uh, that's where we start uh, really taking off uh, with some of these large telescopes that sort of start us on the path of the last 100 years. So uh, at Carnegie Observatory is the Mount Wilson 60-inch uh, telescope. That's 150 centimeters for those who, who keep track that way. Um, that was used to discover the structure of the Milky Way. Um, that was by uh, Harlow Shapley uh, measuring the distance to globular clusters and finding that they were not centered around the sun, but centered around the galactic center. Um, 
And uh, as Juna mentioned, he thought that was the whole universe and had trouble giving that up. Uh, but this was still a very uh, important discovery. Uh, and just goes to show, like, again, if, you're, if your model is incorrect, sometimes the things you think are not correct about your model are totally the wrong things. Um, but this was uh, an example of a leap forward that came from the construction of a new telescope that was the biggest in the world, or one of the biggest in the world up to that point. Uh, not content with that, uh, he went on to build um, on Mount Wilson the 100-inch telescope, uh, 254 centimeters. Um, and that's the one that was, uh, of course, famous for the discovery of external galaxies. I like this photo of Hubble um, because um, does anybody know who the other person sitting on that platform is? That's genes, right? Right. So, uh, so that was a, you know a theorist observer collaboration using a very non OSHA approved uh, platform. <laughs> that's, uh, and so uh, these places are pretty dangerous. But uh, of course, the expansion of the universe. This is probably uh, perhaps the most famous discovery of the 20th century, um, and uh, and it was really enabled. Uh, by the groundwork that was laid before it uh, with the Harvard College Observatory surveys um, and the classification of variables, but also building a bigger telescope to get the high value science. Uh, and of course, there's the period of luminosity uh, curve for the variable star in M31 that he had uh, applied Henrietta Leavitt's law to that uh, to deduce its distance. And there's that. Um, I only show this one because it's kind of fun uh, with Hubble Space Telescope named after him. They then went back and observed the star that he used to do that, which is kind of a nice little uh, closure. Okay, uh, we're almost at the present. So the next telescope, again, built by Hale, uh, the Palomar 5 meter, 200 inch, also called the big eye, as my advisor we used to say. Um, uh, so this was used to discover quasars, which immediately expanded our notion of what the size of the universe could be. Um, also with quasars came the discovery of the intergalactic medium, uh, and also the black hole in M87 uh, was inferred from this telescope. Uh, there's the prime focus of the big eye. Uh, there's Hubble sitting in it. Uh, I put this one just up for two reasons. I made two contributions to that, uh, the one on the right. That was for my PhD thesis. I had helped build that camera, that, that's the blue one that's sitting in there. So I, got, I was one of the last people to ride in that uh, while it was operating. And my other contribution is that those little uh, guy wires that you see there, because while I was operating it, I almost fell out. Um, and so uh, after a while, you had to, to uh, clip yourself in when you're up there. That was... Really terrifying. Um, OK, so after that, there was another stall in aperture growth. Remember when we said in the middle of the last century, apertures kind of stopped. Um, after Palomar, uh, things didn't really increase. There were lots of other telescopes that were built, but the biggest telescope still remained Palomar for many years. But there was another revolution in detectors and instruments. Uh, and this really came from uh, silicon-based sensors, CCDs, uh, which were invented in the late 1960s. Um, here you see uh, the CCD that was uh, this uh, the kind that went on WIFPIC-2 uh, on HST. Uh, and then you see the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey camera. And here uh, we all know what the apotheosis or of uh, CCD cameras is going to be. This is probably the biggest CCD camera that will ever be built, is my guess, right? Um, it may be that by the time we're building another thing this big, it's going to be something else and not CCDs. Uh, but this is really, really beautiful. Uh, and so this is really what's been driving things for uh, through a lot of the 1980s. Uh, until you got to the 1990s, because through the 1980s and going up to that point, uh, it was the structural sagging of mirrors and things like that that were kind of uh, determining uh, what the performance limitations were going to be. But once you could start applying computers so that you could drive telescopes in Altaz and have rotators, uh, and then also you could control them in fabrication and in the control of operation, right? So you could fabricate mirrors uh, in segments, um, and then you could do the finite elemental analysis to do stress lab polishing or actually you stress the mirror and then let it bend back up, or you could stress the polishing, polishing lap while you're making it and use that to control the shape of the mirror. You could spin it uh, while you're annealing the glass uh, and melting it in an oven, uh, or you could control the uh, surface of the primary mirror while it's in operation uh, because you're taking telemetry on the performance of the wave front and then correcting it regularly. Um, so this is what sort of got us through to the next generation of telescopes. You always have to solve these problems because there's like a an punctuated equilibrium in the engineering that sort of takes you to the next level of complexity. Now, um, those six to 10 meter telescopes, which is kind of where we currently are, these were really built at the time to observe redshift two to three quasars. Uh, so I went back to look at the, um, you know, some of the documents uh, around this uh, initial uh, beginnings of construction of the Keck telescopes. Uh, and there's a one page proposal that went in for that. Um, and uh, at that point in time, the most distant object in the universe was at redshift 3.8. Uh, 
uh, and it was a quasar. Um, as we all know, these telescopes of this current generation have observed a lot of other interesting things. So again, what you, you know, it doesn't absolve you from making the case for the telescope you want to build, but you, all, you, you know that there's going to be something else that's interesting. Um, in the case of these telescopes, um, what were their big contributions? Um, there's no one telescope that, that uh, made the discovery that did the things I'm going to mention. It's a combination of telescopes. Um, but the kind of things that they worked on were um, the uh, characterization of dark energy. There was a lot of spectroscopy of type 1a supernovae, um, determining that the, you know, what's the contribution of dust? Is it important? Is it not? Uh, how does this uh, combine with observations that are done with the Hubble Space Telescope? This is a big uh, topic uh, for use of the six to 10 meter telescopes over the last couple of decades. Um, and they all, well, let me not say any more about that. Um, uh, so another one that surprised us all was exoplanets, right? So there was uh, a, a big uh, surprise that uh, you could actually detect the radial velocity wobble of exoplanet or of stars in response to the reflex motion of exoplanets, uh, and that they occupy very different orbits from uh, what we had expected in the solar system. Uh, and then that there you could detect large numbers of these things through transits because they are all so much closer in, and the planets are so much larger. These things are obvious now, and we think that we learned them. Uh, you know, on our mother's knee, but it wasn't that way, right? Uh, and then also, um, you can observe some of these directly uh, in, in ways that we'll hear more about uh, later on in the conference. Uh, and then a, a last one and a favorite of mine that was not expected at the time that those telescopes were built was that we can actually reach into the epoch of reionization and actually see um, the signatures of these uh, in quasar spectra. So that's a qua uh, spectrum of a quasar in the, uh, the top. Uh, and then you can see what the uh, ionization fraction is as you go down. And so those are the, the generation that I've got circled here. So each generation as we went along, uh, I was going to say, has practiced what I call vertical integration. It's not my idea. Um, this is an old concept in economics where um, you start from raw materials, which is the sky down at the bottom. And then you need telescopes that mine that sky and produce targets of interest. Uh, and then you need some sort of way of triaging those and pushing those up uh, to the telescopes that provide the highest value observations uh, so that you can get to finished science products. And what we really want is new understanding of the universe. So finished science products, you know, somewhere in there between the, the just below the finished science products, you should be theory computation. And then up above that, before you get to new understanding, it's going to be we're producing PhDs and people and all of these things that, that universities and institutes uh, like KIPAC uh, do such a good job at, at cultivating. Um, but at, at each generation, this is sort of different generations going from left to right, right? This is the, the 100 years ago. This is our current generation. And this is where we're headed, OK? Uh, and the point is that we have the discovery engine. That's a terrible picture of LSST. But um, then you see the DESI will be the kind of thing that can do great triage. Um, but what are we going to use to do the, the sort of high value? Um, so the traditional economic wisdom, I'm not a, an economist, but my brother is, and I talked to him. Um, and uh, you will say vertical integration does some good things, right? It helps you control your workflow. So you can get from the raw materials to the bespoke product at the end. Uh, an economist would say it reduces your exposure to competitors who are exerting market power, which I'm not sure that really applies. That, uh, you know, we've, we don't produce much of value, but, uh, but at the same time, you know, what we wanna do is start with targets and then turn them into careers and, and discovery. Um, of course, the price of this is that uh, traditionally economists would say to, to be vertically integrated, it takes a lot of investment, it takes a lot of capital, you got to run things. Uh, it also means there's an opportunity cost because in uh, investing up and down your supply chain, you're reducing your flexibility and you're focusing on too many different things. Um, and so in practice, I don't think one institution does all these things, but um, through a public private partnership, the US is actually doing this uh, in its own way. Uh, and I'm going to describe that a little bit. Uh, and it, basically, the idea is that there's uh, three, and I will say one plus two, extremely large telescope projects that are pretty far into their development right now. Um, there's one European one and two uh, that are in the US that are uh, sort of joined at the hip in an interesting way. Um, and th so that's why I'm saying one plus two. Uh, so the European uh, effort is the extremely, uh, the European Extremely Large Telescope, the EELT, building, uh, being built at Amazonas. Um, that's a rendering, an awfully good rendering to the left. It looks pretty lifelike, but that's the real thing on the right. Um, that is under construction. That will be a 39 meter uh, diameter telescope uh, with a 10 arc minute field of view. Uh, and then in the US, um, there's two hemispheres, two telescopes. So the 30 meter telescope would be built on the summit of Mauna Kea. 
uh, with the, that collaboration. This uh, 30 meters, as the name implies. Um, and then there's the giant Magellan telescope. It's a 25 and a half meter telescope that would be built at Campanas uh, in Chile. Uh, and so that would cover the south. You see that's the excavation that's underway for uh, GMT. And then that's a rendering on the right of what it would look like. Uh, I won't go into the differences in the optical design, which are substantial and, and interesting in their own right. Um, but what I was going to point out instead was just that historically, um, uh, integrated workflows, vertically integrated workflows, um, have distributed the uh, the power across Etendu. Uh, and so you often get things that have a small diameter, uh, a small field of view and a large aperture, or a um, small aperture and a larger field of view, or you pair them so that they kind of balance. Um, and so the Harvard Plate Archive in Mount Wilson corresponds to the one of 100 years ago. Uh, and that line that you're seeing going from upper left to lower right is of constant uh, A omega product or Etendu. Um, and then today, kind of where we are, um, so ZTF and SDSS are two of those discovery engines. Uh, and then often these things are followed up with Keck, Magellan, Gemini, things like that. Uh, actually, the discovery engines are beating the, the follow-up machines by a little bit in Etendu. You know, Etendu is not a perfect, uh, a, a perfect proxy for science in this case, but it's a, it's sort of an interesting comparison. Um, but what's going to happen soon is when Ruben turns on, uh, it's actually going to break this because we don't have anything that's even close to following that. Um, and that's kind of, you know, mega mapper is one thing that we heard about in that space, but the ELTs form uh, another part of that uh, parameter space. And we're going to need to have something that keeps up with those discoveries. Uh, and uh, this is where those are going to sit. Um, it's interesting that um, it's still going to be the case that the follow-up instruments fall a little bit below what the discovery engines can do. Although if you add GMT and TMT, they're actually not so far off, um, which is kind of interesting. So that means that those together would probably be enough to uh, satisfy a lot of the, the demand to follow up things and, and capitalize on Rubin science. Uh, let me skip over that. Um, so why now? Like, so why are we talking about building these things at this moment in time? Okay. Um, so I would argue that um, I talked about sort of generation and it sort of jumps in our capability. And uh, I think that with JWST, my own personal uh, experience is that we've uh, taken a huge leap forward in the last year. I don't think that's surprising to anybody, um, but I think we're already here uh, and it's gonna only get better uh, in the, the next couple of years. I think it's not just a little bit better, it's qualitatively a, just a giant leap. Um, I saw this, you know, so I've been involved in a JWST uh, GTO survey uh, of some high redshift quasar fields. This is our first uh, image that came in from that. Um, Oh, here's where JWST sits. That's the, this is HST and JWST. Um, this by itself is kind of spectacular, but what really blew me away is this. Um, so in our first field, these are all the uh, galaxies that we found with uh, spectroscopic redshifts between uh, five uh, and a half and seven, roughly. Uh, and when that came in and I realized we've done five fields now and we have a, a thousand galaxies at that redshift, that's just like, it's a new game, right? It's like not even close to what we were doing a couple of years ago. Um, and we can do it in quasar fields and we can study absorption next to them and all kinds of interesting things. Uh, and there have already been surprises. So we know that there's gonna be surprises every time we build a new telescope. Uh, and that's true here. Um, and since you're standing, we'll talk about those during the questions if people wanna know about those surprises. Uh, but I just wanna close with a, just a quick discussion of why you would build ELTs when we already have JWST. Um, and uh, there's a couple of reasons I would say that. One is that uh, I already know what it's like to have an infrared uh, spectrograph on a six and a half meter telescope. That's exactly what Magellan is. And um, your read noise limited uh, in at reasonable dispersions. And that happens with JWST as well when you get down to the, to the blue. Uh, on the redder sides of that, uh, of JWST, it blows you away because the, it's so cold and it's out in space uh, and the thermal backgrounds are so low. Whereas on the, the ground, you, you lose out. So anything in the blue area of this to the lower right, where all the JWST instruments are, JWST is a huge win. But as you get further to the red, or you go to high, high dispersion, you sort of get the sad trombones with, with JWST, where you see that the sensitivity, like worst sensitivity is high here. Um, and as you go to the left, as you get close to a micron, you see that um, it actually does worse than this little uh, rectangle that I've highlighted is the sensitivity you can do from the ground today with existing telescopes. Um, and so if we wanna win down there, actually JWST doesn't do that well. Uh, and we're going to need um, to build these bigger telescopes to overcome the read noise. Uh, it's also true that uh, being four times bigger than JWST uh, is going to give you a better diffraction limited point spread function. And uh, the adaptive optics are built into these telescopes. Uh, you know, in the same way that doing weak lensing, 
I was uh, struck um, during Shiwei's talk that um, you're doing that weak lensing with a telescope that was built by other people to do other things. Uh, and now you're building a telescope and a camera that's built with this in mind. And it's, I think it's just gonna be really refreshing. Uh, and the same is gonna be true, I hope with adaptive optics. Uh, and we'll hear from Jessica Liu about that. So let me not mention that other than that to say that uh, doing high contrast imaging around M dwarfs, which is 75% of the stars, by the way, um, uh, is gonna be a really interesting thing to do. Uh, and then the last thing uh, is when you build ELTs, uh, sometimes you can look at events that have very short duration and low photon counts. Um, so uh, Kevin Burge is gonna tell us about uh, binaries of really short periods. If you wanna do spectroscopy that's phase resolved, you need a lot of photons and you can't take long exposures because you've already smeared it out over a period. Uh, and kilonovae are the same way. They evolve so fast that you just got to get on them really quick and you just need big apertures. There's no substitute. Uh, and then the last thing is that, um, you know, my own area is that I am interested in instrumentation and the long operational lifetime of these telescopes means that um, if you're on the ground and you're not out at L2, uh, it tightens that loop for doing kind of innovation really quickly, right? You can, if you have an idea, you can implement it. Um, and that's just not something you can do on, uh, NASA doesn't operate like that. Um, NASA does other things that you can't do from the ground. <clears throat> but the idea that you can come up with an idea and work it through to uh, completion so quickly uh, is really interesting. Uh, and I'm working on, actually with the support of the Kavli Foundation, we're working on a, a, a instrument concept uh, out at MIT that might uh, work really well uh, to sort of get us over the first phase of operations of one of these new telescopes. So, um, so there you have it. Um, I didn't go into deep detail about the physical or the, the sort of technical details. Um, but the points I wanted to make is that each generation of telescopes really has uh, yielded discoveries that nobody could have imagined. Uh, I think we're in the next generation. JWST for me was the kickoff of that. It's just so obviously better, um, but it still has very lim significant limitations. Uh, and that if we wanna uh, address those, we need vertically integrated systems of discovery that will then sort of work their way that the highest value targets can, can be observed. And that with uh, spectroscopy that reaches the depths of things that like what Ruben is gonna be able to do. Um, and that vertical integration really requires a public-private partnership. Um, and that's what the US ELT is. Um, and uh, the last point I would just make is that, um, you know, it is our requirement that we have good motivations for doing this kind of science. Um, we all know that none of those justifications we have are as interesting as the things we're, um, we're going to discover that we don't know about yet. Um, we all kind of know that in principle, but I, my sort of historical digression was just to remind us that it happens every time, right? Uh, and uh, there's, there's a good precedent for this. Uh, so thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Rob, for that uh, wonderful walk through the history of Big Glass and then uh, telling us about the upcoming ELT program and its promise. Uh, let's take maybe one or two questions. And um, so to go from the um to the, the GMT, the ELT, those points on that graph to that US ELT point, what would you say are the the major barriers, whether it be financial or technological, to, to getting there? Uh well to <clears throat> you mean how do you well to get from those two points to the one I just added them on this case. Uh, I just said, you know, if both telescopes exist, then the uh, the field of view is the sum of the field of view and the, the sum of the areas. So that was not a, a hard thing to do. Uh, but in practice, uh, I think it's primarily a, a financial and a cultural. I, I think both of the telescopes are in pretty good shape uh, technologically. There's always things you don't expect, um, but they're good enough to go. And I think the projects are basically shovel ready. They've been that way for a while. Um, uh, but I think there's... Uh, you know, the, the, we have that all ready to go. Uh, but I think the, it's, these are expensive projects and the US has to find a way to do it and they have to do it in partnership uh, with institutions that want to be, play a role in that as well. Uh, and I think we've been trying to solve that for the better part of 10 years. And I think we're gonna get there because it's been prioritized in the decadal survey. Um, but that, you know, the Congress has to allocate the money and it has to, to you know, step up and play its role as well. Here's another really quick question. Uh, you didn't mention anything about interferometry, about interferometry. Oh, interferometry. Yeah, try yes. to tie them together and get a pretty good telescope. 
Yeah, that won't be possible for the ELTs in this way because uh, none of the three of them are being built uh, in conjunction with each other. The Keck ones uh, did were used as interferometers uh, for a period of time. Um, and there are other telescopes that are being used as interferometers that are sort of designed that way as, as networks. Uh, and that allows you to, uh, there are pros and cons of doing that. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, of the next generation. I, I think people will start with smaller apertures again, and they're, they're doing that work. Uh, and then also in space, I, I think that's going to be uh, quite interesting in the coming decades. Uh, there's technologies, you know, clocks, thrusters, things like that, that are going to make it uh, increasingly interesting to do that kind of work out there. Okay. Uh, one more, one oh. more quick one. Um, so I, I resonate a lot with your last comment on this slide. About, I mean, we certainly have many specific science motivations, but I think the most exciting is, you know, the things that we haven't thought of. Somehow that never seems to have the same sort of resonance with funding agencies, even though in reality it is what is always the most exciting. Do you have any um, wisdom about how you've heard that story told most effectively? Wow, what a good question. Um, well, funding agencies are trying to do two things. Uh, one is to capture lightning in a bottle and do something that's fantastic, um, but then to do it with zero risk. <laughs> uh, and, and balancing those two things is difficult. Um, I think the uh, you know systems engineering and defining requirements and doing a flow down and a science traceability matrix and all that stuff, that's managing the downside risk and making sure that there's a threshold that you can meet and that you can declare success. Uh, one of my favorite parts of uh, being a director was uh, getting a letter that officially declared uh, test a success. Uh, and I didn't know that that was, I've heard people say, oh, we're gonna officially declare this a success, but you can actually get a letter from the government that says uh, that this happened. Um, but the, uh, in this case, I think going back to the history, right? And telling these stories uh, because Oftentimes, I think we learn history. Well, when we teach physics, we teach it a certain way because people have realized that that's the pedagogically best way to do it, but it's almost never the way that it actually unfolded, right? Um, and actually going back to dig through these uh, the records and figure out how did people get there uh, is quite interesting. And I think that deserves to be told uh, because I think that is uh, something that humans like. Um, I, you know, when I was talking, I, I didn't get to talk about the JWST surprises that are coming, and those are interesting to talk about over coffee or something. Um, but part of the fun is uh, when you're in a period where you actually don't know what the answer is going to be, you don't have a particular hope, and you're kind of feeling your way around, uh, and you, you feel like you're, you, know, you get an intuition as a scientist that you're onto something, um, but you don't quite know what yet. Uh, and that's a fun place to be. And if I could spend my whole career there, I would love to. But, um, you know, you only get a few chances. Uh, uh, so if we could find a way to express that feeling and that emotion, um, I think that could be helpful, uh, but I haven't found the magic formula yet, but I, I it's an excellent question. So. Okay, we should move on now. Um, thank you so much, Rob.